Can you hear me? Oh, gosh, no, you can. Good. Thank you very much for coming today. My name is Richard Barry, and I was the original founder of the FreeRTOS project. FreeRTOS is now under the stewardship of Amazon Web Services, AWS. So now I carry on my work on FreeRTOS as part of a larger team within AWS. I'm going to start this talk just by giving a very, very brief summary of what the FreeRTOS kernel is, because I would hate to get to the end and realize that you didn't actually know what I was talking about. Um, then we're going to look at uh, what's new in the actual product itself and what's new in the ecosystem. And at the end, we're going to look at um, two new architecture ports in FreeRTOS version 10.2.0. Uh, one is the uh, ARM V8M for a Cortex M33. And the other uh, very interesting new project with uh, RISC-V. And I'm delighted to say that uh, Rick O'Connor from the RISC-V Foundation has agreed to come up and give us a little bit of a talk about why that's important. So what is the FreeRTOS kernel? Well, it really depends on your point of view. If you come from the large operating system space, Linux, Android, that kind of thing, you'd probably consider it to be a scheduler, or, uh, or what I refer to it as a kernel. If you come from the bare metal programming, then you would normally refer to it as a real-time operating system. So it really depends on your perspective. Effectively, what it is is a library. It's a library that enables you, if you build it into your application, to organize your application as a set of multiple independent threads of execution. Target audience for this, uh, or um, scheduler, or kernel, whatever you want to call it, it runs on very small devices, and it runs on you know, very big 64-bit devices as well. But the real kind of sweet spot for it is the 32-bit microcontroller space. And there, we're looking at things which are big enough to run something that's complicated enough to benefit from the, you know, the reusability and the maintainability of a multi-threaded design. But we're still talking small, OK? I always like to emphasize this point. So we're looking at a few hundred kilobytes to about a megabyte of program space, a few tens of kilobytes to a few hundred kilobytes of RAM. So that's really you know, to, to get the scale. And these things are sold in their billions, these microcontrollers. On the screen at the moment is uh, the data from our server that shows the number of downloads. You can see that FreeRTOS has been around for a very long time. It's about 15 years. And uh, every, every year, we break the record for the number of downloads. So last year, 2018, was, uh, was no different. It always amazes me. You know, it's downloaded about once every three minutes or something like that. So you know, the numbers always surprise me about you know, how many engineers are there in the world. And over the 15 years, we've really developed a distribution model, I think, which gives uh, users' confidence. If you think the, the software is built into devices which, is that, which are then shipped around the world, users need to know that it's robust. They need to know that it's going to be well maintained, it's going to be well um, uh, supported, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So where does this fit into the work that Amazon do in open source? On this little graphic here, I'm, I'm, it's color-coded by year, right? So these are all the projects that uh, open source projects that Amazon have contributed to over 16, 17, and 2018. So the orange are the additional projects um, over and above the ones in 2016, and then the blue over and above the ones in 2017. And if we look really carefully up here somewhere, on the next slide, I think I highlighted there, you will find uh, FreeRTOS. Now, FreeRTOS is used in all industry sectors, uh, anywhere where you will find a microcontroller. I mean, as you walk around this building, you'll be passing lots and lots of microcontrollers, building control, lighting control, wearable devices, projectors, <laughs> just looking at what I can see from here, et cetera, et cetera. Now, one of the, um, you know, the, the really exciting growth areas at the moment, of course, is Internet of Things, IoT. On the screen now, on the right, uh, the two-thirds, we are showing a subset of AWS services which are targeted specifically at IoT, which then, of course, are a very small subset of the, you know, the great wealth of services that Amazon provide for all industry sectors. 
there, Amazon provide the undifferentiating infrastructure that must be in place before you can get the value of connecting your device. So the gateway to get the data into the cloud, the uh, security, the provisioning, the lifecycle management, the over-the-air updates, et cetera, et cetera. On the left, then, we see the devices which are, uh, sorry, the software which is outside of the cloud. I mentioned very briefly a product there called Greengrass, which is a really uh, interesting product. It enables you to run some of the cloud services actually locally on your premises. So if you want to run machine learning inference or something like that, you can actually do it on your premises or in the cloud. That's not an operating system, by the way. It's Linux software. Amazon Freeartos has found what I call the, uh, the leaf nodes, the edge of the edge here. And this is where you get the huge fan out of devices that are connecting. So the value that Amazon have added here, and um, please keep in mind that all this software is MIT licensed. Uh, you can use it for any purpose you like. There's no actual tie-in to Amazon at all. But the libraries, uh, you know, the value add here is very um, analogous to what's in the cloud. I've kind of lumped them into this, just you don't really care what they are, but that's the security and the connectivity and the key provisioning and all that kind of thing. And um, it uses the FreeRTOS kernel in order to provide higher level functionality with a very, very simple API. Uh, to point out what's new here then, the OTA agent uses the kernel, so it just kind of runs in the background. You just start the OTA agent and it notifies you when there's a new image. That was actually launched last year. Uh, brand new then is the BLE management, which is currently in beta. Okay, so moving on to the ecosystem products. Now, one of the, you know, the really great things about FreeRTOS is the wealth of the ecosystem that's built up over the years. I'm just going to highlight two products here because it's a very short talk. I've, I've selected these products because not only do they add you know, huge value to our users, but they also use AWS services in order to provide that value, so it seemed most appropriate. First, um, you, may have, you may be familiar with Persepio. They provide this really, really nice trace tool for FreeRTOS. That gives you a very, very detailed view of everything that's going on in your system, which tasks are running, which APIs are called, that kind of thing. It's been around a long time. Well, I say a long time, a few years. What's new then is this device firmware monitor. What this enables you to do is in, in the devices which are actually deployed in the field, you can leave this trace recorder running and you can set triggers. Those triggers might be an assert was hit, an, an exception, maybe uh, the system rebooted and you weren't expecting it. And on those triggers, it will send the trace up to the cloud and also notify whoever you want to be notified, presumably an engineer. And they can then see a very fine-grained a view of the scenario, the exact scenario that led to that anomaly. Hopefully then you can fix it and close the loop by performing an over-air update back down to the devices. Now this has obvious, um, obvious uh, advantages from a business perspective because the customers here might not even know that anything went wrong. If they did know that something went wrong, they'll know that it was fixed really, really quickly. Your, you know, your product and your reputation will obviously get, uh, get a, a bonus. That, by the way, is being um, demonstrated, I should have said, in Hall 4. This is on the Persepio stand, uh, booth 305. The next uh, ecosystem product, which uh, is actually being demonstrated on our booth, on the AWS booth, which is Hall 4568, is uh, from Sega. Now, many people will be familiar with Sega. They provide development tools, they provide libraries, but the thing they're most known for is their J-Link uh, debug pods. These are devices that typically you would have a machine, and like I've got here, you've got a connected aboard, but in between the two, you would have a J-Link, and that enables you to flash the device and debug the device. What this remote development allows you to do is rather than have a physical connection to your board, you can put the J-Link into tunnel mode, then your development tools can be hosted in an Amazon workspace, which is basically um, you know, an operating system workspace in the cloud. And there you can have the tools installed, etc. And using this tunnel server, connect to your board wherever it is in the world. 
So, you know, there are, again, probably obvious, uh, obvious um, benefits of doing this, but one of the things I really like about this is that uh, you can use a really, really powerful computer, a, a virtual computer in the cloud, and you only pay what, for what you actually use. It's pay as you go. So rather than all of your engineers having to have a very powerful computer for you know, the fraction of the time that they need it, they, they can do this. And um, it's also very good for uh, you know, managing the I IP. You know, if you have IP on your laptop and your laptop gets stolen or something, then it's problematic. OK, so um, moving on to the uh, version 10.2.0. The first Amazon version of FreeRTOS was version 10. Here I'm going to highlight a couple of new kernel ports. So this is where you know, Amazon are continuing to invest in the kernel as well. As I say, this is, I think, the second or third release. And they're making sure it's kept up to date and all the new features and what have you. The first uh, architecture port that's new in 10.2.0 is the Cortex M33. Now, some of you may know that this, the FreeRTOS code for this has actually been around for a while. Um, what's happened more recently is that we've actually got people building this into products, and what that's enabled us to do is kind of validate that the way we are running the software is the way that our customers actually want it. So this is the first time that the code has been put into an official release rather than being uh, pre-release. If you know anything about the Cortex M33, you know there's a secure side and a non-secure side. So this is just a screenshot of the project, which is in the download. And up here, you can see that there's uh, code running on the secure side and the non-secure side. OK, so then coming on to uh, RISC-V. We've uh, added a RISC-V port because there's obvious demand in the market. There's, um, I think, five or six different unofficial versions of the RISC-V code around. And with FreeRTOS, we always want to do what there is demand for. It's very, very customer-driven. So if we see that there are you know, half a dozen unofficial ports, then there's obviously demand, right? So we have created our own port. That means that it's going through all our own tests and that we can support it to the same standard that we uh, support all our other architecture ports. I think uh, rather than me describe RISC-V and why it's important to us, uh, who better than Rick O'Connor, who's the executive director of the RISC-V Foundation? So I'm going to ask Rick to uh, come up for a few minutes. Great. Thanks, Richard. So before he told you that I was going to come up here and talk about RISC-V, who here has heard of RISC-V before? Oh, that, that's pretty good. Who's downloaded the specs? OK, did you read them? <laughs> Anybody with an active project in the audience, you don't count. Um, working on a RISC-V active project right now. So you are the perfect audience for my talk. OK. So I'm the executive, foundation, the executive director of the foundation. And what is this thing? Where did it come from? The first thing to maybe think about is, why should you care? What's happened recently over the last couple of years? So we'll talk about the, the ecosystem. And it's hard to count how, you know, you can count downloads of, and so on, but it's really hard to count what the adoption's been like uh, for something like an ISA. So as a proxy, we look at what's going on with the workshops and different events that we run. And if you just look in the last 18 months, the thing's kind of taken off like a hockey stick, uh, where we had a few hundred at each of the events in the early years. And then last December, at the event that we ran in Santa Clara, we had, I think it was 1,150 attendees. It was actually not just a bunch of papers. We had a little exhibit space. There were 30 companies with booth and exhibit tables demoing product, commercial product available for sale. Uh, we had 250 abstracts submitted for the event that got translated into uh, 30, 59 sessions, three parallel tracks. So it was a, pretty, uh, it was a pretty, pretty good event. Another proxy you can look at is just the membership growth. In the last 12 months, we've come close to doubling membership in the foundation. You don't have to be a member to use RISC-V, but if you want to participate in how the specs are evolving, what the roadmap looks like, uh, part of the marketing uh, activities and so on, then you'd be a member. So if you just use that as a proxy, that's pretty cool. OK, you don't believe in any of those? This eye chart gives you sort of a who's who in the zoo of what 
what kind of momentum there is behind the technology. And as Richard said, they saw that there was a bunch of uh, you know, unsupported or informal ports of RTOS that were happening already, free RTOS that were happening already. So clearly there's demand uh, to support the architecture. What's all the fuss about? Who cares, really? I mean, geez, it's just an ISA, right? Do we, like, do we care, really? How do we get there? Well, for those of you that are long enough in the tooth, or risk the term, reduced instruction set computing came from a gentleman named David Patterson from UC Berkeley. You may, some of you may have had a Patterson and Hennessy textbook over the course of your engineering education, uh, computer architecture design. It's that research lab at Berkeley where the RISC-V the RISC work came from. And it's not RISC-V, so if you thought it was RISC-V before, you're now deputized as a brand ambassador. If you hear anybody say RISC-V, you tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, no, no, mate, that's Roman numeral five, as in the fifth generation of RISC-based research out of the lab at UC Berkeley. And what we did was, the, this was a project in, in, um, in the spring of 2010 where the team there was saying, hey, we Let's, we need to update our curriculum at the school. We want to do some new things. They looked at a few obvious examples of what they could use as a teaching tool. But if I'm an undergraduate, I've never been exposed to any computer architecture before, throwing an x86 ISA at me as a starting point for learning computer architecture is probably a little complicated, or an ARM ISA for that matter. Not the least of which are the IP issues. When you're teaching stuff, you want to delaminate it, tear it apart, and then stitch it back together again. So they said, hey, we'll start something new. Created a new ISA. We should have it ready for the fall semester. Three months later, everything will be good to go. Well, I didn't, whoops. Did I, am I missing the slide in here? Oh. It took four years. They had lots and lots of tape outs later uh, over the course of those four years that, re that resulted in the release of a spec in, in May of 2014. And what they learned over the course of those tape outs is people were tracking their progress, following along and learning what, uh, what they were doing, giving them feedback anytime they changed something. Hey, I really like what you did over there. You can't change it. So the adoption started to become clear in the industry, and the technology was spun out of Berkeley, and that's how the foundation was created. That's the slide I just skipped. This slide is an example of why, why do we care? I'm getting in front of the speakers. Why do we care? If you look at all the cores on here, they're all quite different cores. They serve a different purpose, so that, that's fine. But they all have different ISAs with a different software stack to support them, a different tool chain to develop on top of them. Some of those uh, cores are visible to the external user in, in an API. Some are just embedded cores for power management or clock distribution and so on. And the firmware comes from the SSC developer. But they're all different. Some are homegrown. Some are licensed in. And do they need to be different? We would, we would say no. Do they need to be proprietary? Absolutely not. And what if we could have one ISA that was suitable for all of these different types of cores? That's what the RISC-V ISA is. And I think this is my last slide. It's simple. It's far smaller than anything you've ever seen. And that's partly because it's been designed to be modular. It's also a clean slate design. There's nothing built into the ISA definition that presupposes what your architecture is going to look like from a microarchitecture standpoint. And the modularity part is the interesting part. If you just have a very low, deeply embedded IoT device that you need integer and maybe multiply divide instructions, that's all you use. And that lets you tailor that device specifically for that application. The other part that's cool is there's a user-defined portion of the opcode space that is reserved. So you can implement your own custom instructions, roll, roll your own hardware algorithm into a handful of instructions and execute that in a purpose-built accelerator and still be compliant with the spec. And building on that extendability, once we lock a set of extensions in, they're frozen, that's it, they don't change. So that's very, very stable design, something that you design today and deploy in the field based on, say, the integer and multiply extensions that I mentioned earlier. Software that's written for those extensions will always run on that device. If years later we find something wrong with some of those extensions, uh, those instructions, that extension won't change. We'll add a new extension. So there'll be another integer-like extension, for instance, that gets added with other instructions. But the point is, those extensions are stable forever. So they're really, really good for embedded applications. So lots more news that you can get there from, the, uh, from our website. And we have a booth over in Hall 3A. 
We're here all week. Happy to answer any questions you might have afterwards. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. That's great. Thanks. So as, as you heard then, it's, uh, it's extensible. So as far as the kernel is concerned, how do we manage that extensibility? I've got a little demo for you here. I've cheated a bit because the board's already programmed, right? Because we're very short of time. But um, the, some of the uh, things that we have to think about here. Oops. In the FreeOSOS download now, you'll find three uh, different RISC-V projects. They're all Eclipse projects, and they're all pre-configured, so you can just go and open it, and I've got one open already. But then we have to think about um, some, of, some of the differences here. And in particular, if, if someone has added value by extending the core, how, how do we cope with that in the kernel? So if I come off to this, is that going to show up on there? No? Try that. There we go. So this is one of the Eclipse projects, and it's the project which is running on this board here. This is an interesting board. I don't know if you saw on the slide just now. Uh, it comes from uh, open-isa.org, and they're basically giving them away for free. I don't know if you have to pay for uh, shipping or whatever, but you can get a board for free. That's actually got four cores on it. And I'm uh, four different cores, and I'm running this uh, example on a uh, pulp, pulp risky core. And one of the things that they've done with that core is giving you uh, hardware acceleration for loops. So there are two sets of three registers for, registers for hardware acceleration. So you can see how you can optimize the, the uh, implementations of your RISC-V chips. If you're familiar with uh, the layout of FreeRSS, you'll, you'll know that the, the, um, most of the source files are common to all the architecture ports. And then there's this portable layer, which someone pointed out to me was an interesting name for it, because it's the code in the portable layer is the only bit that is not portable, because it's actually directly for a compiler and a architecture. So um, you go to GCC as your compiler first, and then the architecture, which is RISC-V. And then we've added this new thing here, which is the, uh, let's open this up, RISC-V chip specific extensions. So you can see I've got this Pulp Vega RVM32 M1. This is this board here. And then if we look at what's actually inside there, firstly, it's describing what, what the interrupt controller it has but this is the bit of interest here. I've just said that this uh, has an extra six registers. So we have to set this macro to say there are six additional registers. And then we have to provide a save additional registers and a, underneath there a restore additional registers macro. Now, I won't get into the details of exactly what this is doing, but it's, it's effectively uh, copying the additional registers into core registers and pushing them onto the stack. So as we, um, if I can come back to the presentation. Oh. Oh, there we go. So as, as we uh, look at the demos that are in there, the top two there don't have any additional registers. So there's just the default macros that you include, which are null macros. For this Vega board, we have implemented this, uh, the macros for you already. But if you're designing your own RISC-V architecture and you want to put some extra functionality in there, some kind of accelerator, as in this case, or whatever that extra functionality is, you can then use the base architecture, sorry, the base port, and then just create these macros to do anything which is an addition on your particular board. And with that, I've come to the end of my talk. Uh, I hope it was useful to you. It's a very, very brief run around of everything we are doing. Well, not everything we're doing, a subset of what we are doing. There's more information on the web, naturally. And um, this, this book is something which is it's a free book provided by Amazon. And you can go and download that and learn a bit more about uh, Amazon's work in open source software. And with that, I think I'm out of time. 
So I can't take questions now, but I'm happy to hang around afterwards and talk. Maybe, maybe at the back there where there's uh, a bit more space. That's it. Thank you.